What's up, everybody? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast with your boys, Matt Wolf and Joe Fear. Check it. Wiki. Rich, how you doing, man? I'm doing well and happy to be here. Yeah. yeah. Throw that microphone Somewhat a closer. Somewhat sunny San Diego. <laughs> yeah, you came at a weird time. It's been uh, winter. It actually rained this morning, which is weird. Bipolar weather. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, thanks for making the trip out, too, because you came from the East Coast. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, were you in New York or, or I flew Baltimore? I in from New York. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because so that's where you live in now, mainly. That's where I'm spending a couple of days a week and sometimes in Baltimore, sometimes in Florida, but oh, bouncing man. around. Okay. Sweet. Well, thanks for making the time. I know you brought your old crew here too. Yep. We <laughs> <laughs> won't mention them. Um, so yeah, I mean, you're doing a whole bunch of stuff. I know you have a big launch coming up as well. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's, there's lots of interesting things that um, I feel like there's just a lot of cool angles that you've been holding to yourself for some time you know you sure. kind of took some time away from uh being public i guess yeah. with with a lot of your knowledge so i think this is really fascinating it's a cool like time to bring it all back and and you know just really share what you've been doing for a long time because you and i have had some calls uh, mm-hmm. last week and right. you kind of showed us the vast <laughs> amount of stuff just in your Evernote alone, right. we're, we're just blowing our minds we're like dear god <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh I guess let's go back unless you want to. You no, that's where I was going to go. I was going to say cool. let, let's go back to your story um, okay. and let's let's chat a little bit about how you got into the marketing world. We don't. Ha- I know you, yeah, you're going on a lot of podcasts and you've talked story. about it a lot. But right. Let's kind of um, let, let's talk about a few of the the sort of bigger points along your career trajectory that led you to here. Sure. Um, and how you got how you got started in this? Yeah, uh, the short of it, I guess we could say my pre-internet life was kind of varied. I um, owned a clothing store that then turned into a music label and did well with that. And uh, it became like the hot store in Manhattan. So Mm -hmm. I kind of got a different side of marketing from that, Mm -hmm. more image style type marketing, public relations, that kind of thing. Uh, Then I opened up a hypnosis center that grew into a chain of hypnosis centers. And so from that, I learned a lot about direct response marketing Mm -hmm. actually found that the marketing I was doing in my music and clothing businesses was not the same and uh that there was a science to the direct response as far as getting the phone to ring for our hypnosis centers mm-hmm. right. and uh then 9-11 happened and uh all my centers were in manhattan and uh well they weren't all in manhattan they were in manhattan and brooklyn and queens but uh mm-hmm. we kind of got royally screwed in that Don't situation yeah. and uh and then i made some bad decisions on top of that hmm. um so I had to get out of the hypnosis business, sold that business, and uh, then decided, what am I going to do next, mm-hmm. really? And yeah. uh, moved down to Florida because I wanted to get out of uh, New York City after 9-11. And um, that's when I started to explore with uh, online marketing and started actually with eBooks mm-hmm. early on. Yep, yep. And, uh, is that the manifesto days and all uh, that? Pre that, or pre? actually. Okay. Um, this is like 2001, uh, oh, okay. 2002. And started publishing a lot of different like ebooks in well first jumping around in lots of different areas yeah. then uh, then starting just in the parenting niche and then when I was struggling because I wasn't really making the kind of money that I was used to making mm-hmm. um, uh, and I was looking at my journal as to why I kind of figured out I was treating the online business differently than how I treated my offline businesses and and that is what led to the manifesto um, uh. so when I kind of made that realization, uh, you know, I drew that diagram in my journal. I then started treating my ebook business differently and started to actually build it for scalability and leverage and things of that nature. And was so, that kind of the big piece that was different from yeah, the offline? Yeah. Online? Well, you know, the, uh, and I guess like it was just a perfect storm of badness. Um, <laughs> the, I had, Towards the end of the hypnosis centers, we had 60 hypnotists full time on staff, and wow. you know our staff was over 100. And so, towards the end of that business, like the pain of making payroll mm. every two weeks um, was very fresh in my mind when I was deciding what next to do. Right. Sure. And at the same time, like a lot of stuff that was selling the online entrepreneurial experience was selling it by like you know check your stats an hour a day at the beach kind of thing. <laughs> and I had learned marketing and direct response well enough from the hypnosis centers that I was like, wow, maybe I could just like design some marketing stuff online uh-huh. and then make money passively and not have employees and not have mm-hmm. all this kind of stuff. What that 
defaulted to was me trying to do everything and I'm not very good at many things. Uh, so it wasn't until later on when I had the realization that I've never tried to do everything in any of my other businesses. There's lots of stuff I never did. Sure. And uh, that needed to be the same in this business. And then just approaching things more from that perspective, more from a long-term business standpoint um, was like kind of the catalyst of yeah. like m first me doing very well online, then me teaching others how to do well online. That makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. I mean, it's probably a blessing that you had the brick and mortar thing first and big overhead yeah. in an expensive yeah. city in the world. <laughs> I'm curious, were there any like universal truths that you learned that apply to both the offline business and the online business that maybe when you started the online business, you kind of you know, threw out because you thought maybe it was only for the offline stuff? Um, I would say that um, everything pretty much applies. There's really mm. not very much different at all. Um, you know, in... In Manhattan, um, you're paying a lot of money for rent, mm -hmm. right? And you're paying rent, which would be the same as paying a lot of money for advertising or pay per click or something like that. Um, but a lot of the same principles, even like how I compete and how I've run my businesses, are the same. Um, they weren't when I first started, mm -hmm. and then I realized how important it was uh, afterwards. So, like the store, for example, um, it was, you know, it was on Broadway, and so every other major retailer is there, and I had to compete with them, and so, you know, it's like, what do I have that they don't have? Mm -hmm. And there's not very much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But what You're they scrappy, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, what they yeah. don't have is me, right. and that's about it. Um, <laughs> they can hire everyone else. Um, so the so you know, the, I built the store based on what I liked, and made it a store where you would always remember that you had walked into that store whether you liked it or didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And so very early on, like I realized it was better to be different than just better. Right. And that's always been something consistent in a lot of the stuff that I do. And uh, yeah, but managing by metrics and all that kind of stuff, we did that in the store and we did that in the hypnosis center. So I wouldn't say it was any different. Mm -hmm. It was just actually, I thought it was different. And then I realized how much of the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I would say pretty much yeah, I can't think of anything that's that different from online yeah. to offline. What is interesting to me, and it's still like, uh, is pronounced to me, is that, you know, there's that famous Steve Jobs uh, speech he gave at the commencement mm -hmm. of Stanford. Mm -hmm. And he talks about like trusting your gut and how like you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect the dots looking backwards. And that speech, and then looking at how many people I've worked with that over, it took them a long time to figure out what their thing was. Um, and just that it took me years to realize that, you know, that I had something to teach other marketers and other people who were trying to build online businesses, even though I had those offline experiences yep. and were successful with those, I didn't see the correlation until after the fact. Mm, right. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes sense when you're, you know, there's a load of stuff that just got thrown on you and the rest of the world, you know, at 9-11 and, you know. It's yeah, there's that, but it's also like, I, I don't know if you have this tendency, I know I certainly do, and I would imagine maybe a lot of other people do too, kind of devaluing what we know mm. and valuing more what we don't know or what mm -hmm. others know. Sure. And so I think that, you know, as long as I was doing that, when I first got online, I was buying everything, you know, studying mm -hmm. everything and not really taking a step back and thinking about, well, what is it that I already know? Mm. Like, what has that produced? Yeah. Like, as opposed to just ditching everything I know, mm -hmm. right? And going into a new field. And it sounds like that, I guess that kind of white space, more or less, you had, you know, after everything kind of fell apart a little bit more or less in sure. New York, allowed you to see that. Yeah, yeah, I would say that, and then also, I guess it's an ADD thing, but just wanting to be different mm -hmm. helps, yeah. you know. So if you had like a, a storefront on Broadway, you, you, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's some element of you get some foot traffic, and there's some just sure. discoverability. How was that transitioning from that kind of business to online, where you know you've got to basically bring people to you? Well, yeah. So the you know the offline world is great, and I would have other businesses in it today. But, um, but yeah, there's, it's a night and day difference as far as like right now, right. I sell for lack of a better way of explaining it air, right. Mm -hmm. Just, mm -hmm. you know, my voice captured my image captured, it's whatever. Ones and zeros. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's no inventory <laughs> as opposed to carrying millions of dollars of inventory right. and mm -hmm. having to worry about that inventory going bad, like just because, you know, it becomes out of, 
out of style or someone steals some of it or mm-hmm. it gets damaged or, you know, whatever. So it's such a better business from that standpoint, right? right? Um, the overhead is way less and the cost of goods mm-hmm. sold is insignificant. Right. What is different is, is that there is no inherent demand, mm. right? right? That's the difference. And, um, and so you have to generate your own demand and, uh, and that's a function of being in touch with the market as well as, uh, being in touch with the market as far as where they're at so that you know where their next step is to mm. go. And I think that, um, yeah, unfortunately I don't know that most business owners probably don't spend enough time on that. Uh, no, we actually realized that recently with a lot of our affiliate promotions. We're like, you know, it's something that most affiliate marketers don't do is actually study who they're selling to, you right. know, and the, and the avatar that that product really wants to attract. And that's been our number one focus lately is that. And, but it's, to me, it's, and I, we were talking about this earlier, to me, it's more than that. It, it, mm-hmm. uh, it's, uh, and it's kind of dovetails into what I was saying before, and maybe that's the theme of what I have to say today, <laughs> although I don't think it is, but um, is just really appreciating your own knowledge, like your own experience, yeah. and making sure that that doesn't get lost. So, you know, whether it was the fact that, oh, I knew things about growing a business, and maybe I should have held on to those things when I first got online, or, you know, if you, if you like, if you're looking at, any kind of like affiliate experience or something like that. Like, well, what was the best affiliate experience you had, mm-hmm. right? Using that as mm-hmm. first a barometer. Right. And, and it goes to something that this was part of the conversation earlier, not with you guys just mm-hmm. earlier on, <laughs> um, that, you know, I've taught this one thing for the longest time and it's from a quote that I can't, say who said it because it's been attributed to too many people um that means it's good then. yeah and 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 the quote is is that which is most personal is most general and i've always used that when i wrote my reports to kind of be willing to share experiences that i didn't think most people would be willing to share whether mm-hmm. i att- attributed it to myself or to someone else and that what was consistently a lot of the feedback i would consistently get from my reports was uh, people would tell me it felt like you were sitting over my shoulder, like you <laughs> yeah. knew my experience. And it wasn't that I knew their experience. I knew my experience, but no one was talking about it, yeah. right? Because everyone yeah. thought that they were alone with that thing. And I'm reminded of all this, and I was, at least this morning I was reminded of all this, because uh, there was uh, a fight this past weekend, Conor McGregor mm-hmm. and right. uh, Cowboy Cerrone, and I'm yeah. a big fight fan. And Cowboy Cerrone is known for having problems like uh, at, in the big fights so of right. getting nervous. Yep. And so then he, they did an interview, uh, like a 10 or 15 minute interview where he actually walked people through like the entire experience of like what a fight is for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what was really interesting is, is that they then cut back to like ESPN and they had like two different former champions on and they both said, I can't believe that he goes through that. I go through the same exact thing. Right. And they've Mm -hmm. just both had never shared that because they all thought that they were alone with that. Right. So that's a little bit different of a slant of like appreciating your own information, Uh but it's Uh still the same, you know, from a standpoint that you, there's more good things in each and every one of us than we kind of give credit to. Right. So much of the the things that we see as vulnerabilities that we don't feel like sharing. Almost everybody sees those as vulnerabilities, but nobody's talking about it. Right. And the hardest thing in marketing at least is, uh, or at least one of the hardest things in marketing is to make it clear to the prospect that you're talking to them, Mm -hmm. to them, like specific, right? That this, that there are one of the easiest ways for a prospect to opt out mentally of a sales message is to say, this doesn't apply to me, right? Mm -hmm. Like, just like if we're sitting in a room and four people are talking marketing, one of the easiest ways to not pay attention to that, like that conversation is be like, this doesn't apply to me or my business or whatever. So it's, yeah, it's that. Mm. Makes sense. Yeah. And maybe Cowboy shouldn't have uh, given all that away. Well, no, no, I think it was fine. I think it was fine giving it away, but it's it's really just that, you know, since most people walk around feeling misunderstood, your You're prospects right. too. Um, and most marketing messages do not make them feel understood. If you have a marketing message that makes them feel understood, mm. you resonate at a very different level. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Much and deeper, much quicker. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. we all suffer from certain problems or conflicts that we would like the solution to but we don't necessarily know who 
really has the answer. Right. Yeah. Right. I think in our own heads, we're really bad at like creating our own filters and deciding which stuff is important to share and which stuff should we just hold back because it's not relevant. I'm, I'm kind of curious. Do you have like any, like how, how do I determine, okay, this is worth sharing. This will be valuable to others versus this is probably too personal. Don't put it out there or. You know. Well, what I would say is, is uh, like to get micro on that for a second, I mm-hmm. would say that it's, I, I'd say that the more vulnerable, the better, but you don't always have to ascribe it to yourself. You mm-hmm. could be talking about a client. You could talk about like many clients in the past have, mm-hmm. have voiced a similar concern or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you'll still see that it resonates. Right. Mm-hmm. But what I would also say, and it, and it is a, it's specific, actually, it's kind of random, but it's specific to what, um, where I think the future is going, mm-hmm. um, that most people don't spend enough time really kind of dialing in the right sources. For themselves so whether it's their own experience being one source that should actually be given a greater priority mm-hmm. or figuring out which sources of information are the best sources for them for their outcome for their goal like you know etc because yeah. what i what you know i tend to teach uh entrepreneurs business owners how to be more strategic and grow their businesses and part of being strategic as it relates to the amount of information that's out there is uh, recognizing that every single piece of information takes your attention away from another piece. Right. Right. So you have to be very selective in the source. Like think about how your, how you process your email. You probably look at the from before you look at the subject line or look at, you know, how you look at text messages. It's sorted by who, Mm -hmm. not by what was said. Right. Right. And, uh, and people should kind of take a note, from their email and from their messages and start thinking about which sources one being my own Mm -hmm. for sure first right but Uh then other than addition to that what are the what sources are immediately greenlit like into consumption for me right because that's a source that's proven out over and over and over again versus something that's not right Right. it's more or less creating filters for ourselves starting with us right and then um because right now with the changing you know everything it's just so many bleep blops notifications content 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 right and a lot of folks and even podcasts alike you know it's like i gotta consume this 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 oh he said this but they said then it's conflicting right and that's where i think a lot of confusion is in the market as well right exactly so it's like I'll give you a good example uh, or a quick example of mm-hmm. this. Um, I love to I love reading blog posts and things like that, and uh, and I love blog posts that are like the top twenty books to read for this or the mm-hmm. top ten books for that, and blah blah blah. But I don't feel any um, I don't feel any inner conflict not reading any of those. I save <laughs> them quite a bit, and every once in a while I'll read one or two because like I have a different strategy for books, and that and that strategy for books keeps me up to date. Um, at least on anything new. Mm -hmm. And so that's like an area of noise that I can take out of my life, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Totally, yeah. Yeah. Right, and the strategy, just in case someone's like, well, what is that strategy? Um, I tend to look at the books I read that I really like, look at who got, who reviewed it first. Uh Um, Like one of the longer reviews that kind of breaks down the book, see if they're like a top 1,000 reviewer, and if they are, I start following them. And so I end up having... A ton of people who get the books early, who write comprehensive reviews, quote unquote, kind of working for me because sure. you can follow them on Amazon. You can follow reviewers. Right. What are, what are, so, where are some places to find those types of folks? On Amazon. No, you follow uh, them. Like you oh, go to the Amazon. Reviewers. Oh, got just it. Read the book reviews. Re- yeah. Got it straight up right on right. there. Okay. And so Amazon is alerting me to what these people who that's are okay. great readers. And, mm-hmm. and so it's, so that's another source, right? But that's a filtered source. Sure. But anyway, um, I guess a long tangent to this idea, though, that uh, especially nowadays, um, with there being so much info out there, so many people who claim to be experts in every different area, um, you got to kind of nail down your sources first right. before you nail down strategy or you know anything else that you know you're planning on doing online mm-hmm. um, or in your life. I guess. Now, how, how yeah. do you how do you discover? news sources because i I mean i I guess my fear would be if we sort of filter and create these filters you essentially create like an echo chamber and you know then new stuff yeah i'm not saying i'm not saying like ignore the the world right right (laughs) but there are um 
you know, it's kind of like there are different levels of priority uh, that you place on pretty much everything, mm -hmm. right? You know, depending on how you feel about your mom, like if she were to call right now, you'd either take that call or not take that call. Right. Um, some mm -hmm. people would interrupt the podcast and take the call. Some sure. people wouldn't, right? So it, it's it, it's some level of information needs to go right in, mm -hmm. right? Not even be evaluated. Others need yeah. to be slow walked. Um, so partly that, but I think, at least my experience has always been that like, if I read a really good book, mm. um, oftentimes I will then buy every other book that that person has written. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, especially if I really liked it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, and I read a lot of bibliographies too of mm -hmm. every book. Um, so I'm always looking for like which books consistently come up in a field, what have you. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I look, there's always some amount of time for discovery. And I think that's like probably 20 or 30%. Mm -hmm. Um, but then checking sources is probably, I don't want to say it's, it's, I just want to say it's much more important than people realize. Right. Right. That makes sense. That, that there should be some people that are at the top of the list that have always proven to provide useful, profitable, really good information. Those are the people that, you know, you don't want to wait until you get to the end of your email box to clean it up to get to that person's email. Right. 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 Yeah. So uh, going back to your story. So okay. you, yeah, we went all the way back there. Um, you know, you did a lot, obviously you started coaching a lot of the, the big players that are around sure. nowadays. Uh, talk a little bit about that. And then you, you basically, you were like the strategic almost guy. Yeah. You were forward facing, but you're also behind the scenes a lot, it sounds like. Yeah, that. so uh, I uh, I started coaching. Well, so I started going to like internet marketing seminars, I guess, at around 2001. Mm -hmm. um, by 2003-ish, I guess, somewhere around there. Yeah. Um, I was starting to do well because I kind of had that. Or it was either 2003 or 2004, sometime around there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I started doing well because I had that epiphany about the U diagram and all that. And so a lot of the friends that I had made earlier on at some of these events, uh, I just started helping because they needed it. And they didn't have the same experience that I had come online with as far as all that offline experience. So what I found was is that it wasn't as easy for them to just switch to that mode because they didn't know that mode. Right. right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I found I really enjoyed it. And so I decided I wanted to try it, see coaching and see if I liked it. Uh -huh because I never really thought of myself as like a coach. Um, and so, yeah, so I, 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 we were, I, I did a program with um, Jay Abraham and mm -hmm. at the end of the program, um, we had an event. And so I made it open for 25 people to apply for that. And uh, I worked with them for a year and a half. Uh, I didn't know how long it was going to take, but okay. the guarantee was uh, that you would cut, the amount of time you work in half and you would double the amount you make. So like a four X kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Sexy. Um, or they'd get all their money back and I was personally coaching them. And so the, the goal was for me to figure out like, can I, could I coach everyone to that outcome? Mm -hmm. And it was by application so that I wasn't going to spend, you know, I think I spoke to each person twice a month personally. Um, okay. I wasn't going to spend time talking to someone I didn't like or I mm -hmm. didn't feel could filter, filter. Yeah, yeah, get to the outcome, especially since I was going to be dedicating a lot of personal time right. to each person. But that was the start of it. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, so in that group was like Mike Vilsane, who I think went from like 10,000 a month or 15,000 a month to like 380,000 a oh. month or uh, Danny Johnson and her husband Hans, who went from like a half a million to six million. It was, you know, one after another. And um, so then I, after working with them and kind of being like, okay, this is, this is solid mm -hmm. and this gets people great results and looking out into the marketplace and realizing that no one really cared about business at that time. There were no online business coaches at that time, uh, for sure. I know because <laughs> I was the first one. Right. And so there was no one there before me and no one was really interested in it. And that was the thing. No one was really interested in it. And so I had this issue where it's like, you know, I, I have this... Uh, cartoon from my like in my presentation where the guy that like invented the wheel uh -huh, yeah. and he's like showing it to these guys who are like trying to push a card on squares mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, yeah and they're just too busy to like take the wheel and i felt like i had the wheel like for a lot of these people when you know i'd consistently shown every single person i'd worked with their business had grown tremendously but no one was interested in business information <laughs> online um and i had this project uh with agora publishing like uh, three months later so i had this like three month window where i'd ended the coaching program 
there wasn't a lot of demand for what I had to offer. And, um, and then this big project with this company that I do a lot of work with, uh, then, and even more now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I decided that I would try and do like an 11 week coaching program because I had three months. So that would be 12 weeks and, um, decided to write a report to hope to get like 10, 12 clients, like mm-hmm. just to work with over those three months. Uh, and what I put in the report was based on kind of two things. One, I was listening to a Dan Kennedy uh, product like on coaching and uh, someone asked the question that I would have asked and mm-hmm. said like, uh, you know, how do I create front end products? I'm afraid of cannibalizing my coaching program and this and that, which was uh, my fear. And yep. Dan Kennedy just laughed and said, Bubba, you don't get it. You put <laughs> your best stuff in those products. And I was like, wow. And so me always wanted to be different. I figured I'd give them away free, not even put them in my low price products. Sure. And, uh, and then the other idea was, is like, why do I believe business is a solution versus my prospects who don't believe that's the solution? How can I bring them to my, what were the realizations that I had that brought me to this conclusion? Can I bring my prospects to the same, re- mm-hmm. uh, you know, revelations? Um, and so I wrote this report, uh, the internet business manifesto and put it on my blog. And, and then I guess you could say the rest is history. Cause right. I had no idea when I wrote those 30 pages that my life was going to change, but it changed. It blew up. Yeah. Yeah. It spread like wildfire. And what year was that? That, you put that was out? 2006. And okay. I know in like, I don't even remember now. I think in 2008, we were, we were celebrating over a million downloads. And I think in 2012 or so, 2 million downloads. And I don't think we <laughs> yeah. count anymore. So I don't have any idea. Uh, it's so rare many. that an ebook yeah. <laughs> like right. last longer than six months in the yeah. internet marketing world. Well, wow. and so like I wrote six more reports like in the mm-hmm. next 17 months after that, because this hell, the like, it worked so well, <laughs> like I might as well write some more. And, um, yeah, and so that those reports are really the backbone of my entire business. Yeah, I think and, we got our hands on the Internet Business Manifesto in like 2010. I didn't realize that yeah. was like four years yeah. after yeah, you wrote right? it. <laughs> <laughs> Three, you know, five million probably already downloaded. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> late to the scene. But yeah, so um, and and you mentioned Agora. I know you've done some amazing right. things to grow that business as well. Uh, so it's it's it, it's really interesting because you've. Yeah, lately at least you haven't really been so public. You know, I, I've been very, you know, I, I took five years off and then for a year and a half, I was just behind the scenes at Agora, Yeah, you know, for a while. Yeah. So what were you during doing during that time? Like were you doing just a lot of research and because I know you've always been kind of a trendsetter right. looking at what's You're talking to about come. which time, the five years off or the... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All that time <laughs> off, basically. Um, That was, well, I'd say in the... the my personal, the, the five years off, I think, um, I, I unplugged a little bit from online stuff. I'd say I kind of, kind of kept a view of it, but not really, I couldn't tell you like what were the big shifts or anything at mm-hmm. that time. It really was reflecting a lot more internally on myself. Um, because when I, I thought it was really strange that by the time I was 38, I had already, or early thirties, actually, I had already achieved what I had wanted to achieve by the time I was 40. Mm. And by the time I was 38, I started really thinking a lot about that. By the time I was 40, I was re- recognizing that I wasn't that happy and I had achieved everything that I thought was going to make me happy. So then that kind of opened up a door, Pandora's box, <laughs> uh, that to, to keep that shut for <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah. But the, um, so I'd say I spent a couple years like on transformational type stuff, but what, but I, I would say that um, maybe it's a belief I have, maybe it's, uh, or maybe it's just an ADD brain thing, but no matter what I do, um, I see relationships between what I'm doing and mm. what I've done and what mm. I will do. Um, so even the transformational type stuff that I did, and I did a lot of that, um, I came away with a lot of takeaways that are useful in an entrepreneurial context, right? Right. So I would say that uh, it was very useful. It was very necessary for me. Sure. Um, but it also gave sure me a, all of us needed it yeah, in some way. <laughs> gave me a better perspective. And then, um, but then as I started to, uh, I always had uh, a small number of private clients. And as I heard certain things from certain private clients, it got my attention. And then from there, uh, I started investigating some AI stuff. And that's when I sold half my business to Agora and okay. then uh, came into Agora 
and with the idea that we were going to launch pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But I got tied into a bunch of projects inside of Agora and uh, with AI and data and really looking at how could they best perform, especially in a time when they're, they've been fighting with a lot of the platforms. Mm. And that what is what led to then me finally coming out of the doors of Agora, I guess you could say. It's still, you know, sure. it's still the business is there. Foot in, foot but, <laughs> um, but doing what we're doing for Agora for the world, I guess. Right? right. So let's talk about some of those key things that are in the forefront of your mind now that you've, you know, you've seen work inside of Agora, but right. also for others, your private clients. Well, even before we go there, what I would yeah. say is, is that like, you know, one of the big things, uh, and I'm sure we'll get to the, um, the live stream in a uh -huh. bit, but oh, of one course. of the big things about the live stream that I think like, not specifically to the live stream, but just to anyone who's marketing or trying to grow a business online today is to recognize that the platforms are really in control of way too much and they will continue to uh, infringe upon those things that help small businesses succeed. So Google, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Google, Facebook, it, yeah. Amazon really are okay. the three. I mean, Instagram is part of Facebook, right? right. So you have Apple, which controls a lot of podcasts and apps. And stuff yeah. Like that, and Apple know? has uh, more control than, uh, than they should too. I would say mm -hmm. they're the least um, bad. Uh, bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As yeah. far as the, the selling and, uh, and sharing of data. Yeah. And, uh, and also just dominance. Uh -huh. So yeah, you we know, were talking to somebody on the podcast the other day who kept saying GAFA, G A F A, GAFA, yeah. GAFA. And we, at one point, there's we're like, Fang. "What is GAFA?" Yeah, yeah. there's there's a whole yeah. bunch of different acronyms: Google, Apple, Am uh, Facebook, and Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, and also like anytime you have the word "big" mm -hmm. in front of an industry, it generally starts relating to the downfall of the industry. So there, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's big oil, big pharma, big, big tech, pharma, right? Yeah, like, tech, yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah, it's never something positive. Right. Interesting. Um, yeah, and, uh, and so, yeah, so it's just that, you know, we've, we've passed a couple thresholds recently that are um, just really alarming, you mm -hmm. could say, right? Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, one stat that came out a couple months ago is that um, Google, like less than 50% of the people that search on Google leave the page. Right, which wow. is insane. Wow. Um, yeah. Because, you know, Google, why do people go to that search engine? They go to that search engine because of scraped content of all the different websites in the world. Mm -hmm. If people aren't leaving to go to those websites, then Google seems to, to be profiting from our scraped information. And sure. Yeah. Now with the people, featured snippets, they're yeah. putting the answer right there on this right. before they're, you have to click anywhere. Yeah. Doing you know, that with podcasts, too. They're yeah. Starting to transcribe all that now. Yeah. yeah. And now Watch Facebook, out. you know, and Facebook did the same thing. I mean, if you guys remember, like back in 2010, 12, 13, where every brand in the world was like, like us on Facebook, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Like McDonald's, Burger King, everybody was sending their prospects, right? <laughs> because like there was, you know, at least the way the platform worked at that time was, is that the fans of your page would see your announcement. Right. So after they got everyone, then they were like, okay, then we're done with that. Now, yeah. like you now have you to pay, paid. right? Yeah. And yep. so the first, like the first thing I would say is just recognize the fact that the platforms aren't your friends. Yeah. Right. Even and, Amazon's got the Amazon basics thing where they're seeing what's selling yeah. well and they're just knocking it off themselves. Yeah. yeah. I mean, these companies have way too much power and control. And unfortunately, part of their growth strategy is to cannibalize a lot of other industries. Right. That right? built the supply that they yeah. deliver. Now mm -hmm. they're bringing it into what the walled garden is what right. they're calling it. So that's what the platforms are. Right. Essentially. Yeah. So I, I, I would start with that. Okay. Right. And, uh, and recognizing that and recognizing that there is a continue, like it didn't like Google's not stopping it. 51% mm -hmm. staying on the page. Right. It's mm -hmm. going to go higher. Right. Yeah, and, that's and, what they want. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not going to get easier to get people off of Facebook onto your site. It's going to get more difficult. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not. So I think what any entrepreneur or marketer has to recognize is, is that like probably like I had this friend that uh, he used to listen to like evangelical uh, music, uh, 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 preachers. Okay. Right? Yeah. And uh -huh. this one guy preached wealth and, uh, and, but I just, he had this one sentence that is very applicable here. Uh -huh. Um, just a little bit different, but he, he used to say today is the poorest day of the rest of your life, right? Like today, Ooh. like, cause Ooh. like, you know, today is the poorest day of the rest of your life. Well, today is like the easiest it's ever going to be 
to profit and work with Google, Facebook, and Amazon mm. today, right? Mm-hmm. Tomorrow's going to be more difficult. The <laughs> next day is going to be more difficult. The next day after that's going to be more difficult, right? Right. Because, like, you know, talk to anyone who was advertising on Facebook in 2012 and 13, they can tell you how much easier it was, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, my God. Right? Even, even today, YouTube is easier than Facebook and Google. Yep. But, not for long. But not for long, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So mm-hmm. it's, it's understanding also the, you know, the, um, the life cycle of any of these platforms and when is the right time to be on them yep. uh, and focus versus not. But just that basic understanding that you can't be, you know, obviously people come to someone like me in one of two scenarios. Generally, everything's going great and mm-hmm. they just want to grow, grow, grow. Or everything is horrible and they've tried everything and, and nothing. <laughs> they have nowhere going. to turn. Yeah. 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 So, a lot of those horrible scenarios are when someone was very platform dependent, right? Mm-hmm. Right, like they were totally relying on Facebook, and now Facebook sure. kicked them out, or they were totally relying on Google, and now Google's just decided they don't—they're not interested in that industry anymore. Yeah, right. right? You're playing by their rules, right? So you know, understanding that, and understanding that the that you really do want to make sure that you're not overly relying on any individual platform and that you're doing everything that you can to extract what you can from the platform, but at the same time, uh, not make your business reliant on that platform. Makes sense. Yeah. Now, what are some of the ways that when, when people are asking about this, what are some of the recommendations you're making to sort of release some reliance on those platforms? Well, I, you know, it's interesting because when I left the market, the market was very joint venture and affiliate focused mm-hmm. to a detriment, like mm-hmm. too much so, right? Right. Yep. Um, and in the, in the time of my absence, right, most people, um, really started to nail down acquisition better. Mm -hmm. Uh, so low price point, whether it's like the invention of the tripwire, Mm -hmm. right. Um, or, you know, the ease of just creating these types of funnels, um, that's become, you know, a very, uh, common strategy yeah, yeah, that yeah, everyone's using well, right the, the barrier to entry has just gotten lower and right. lower and lower yeah. and so and actually i wrote about this um in the third report i wrote which was called the uh, final chapter it was like i thought i was done writing report <laughs> never done um and that was more all about agora and uh-huh. it was about um the concept of front end and back end and using front end to acquire and it was also about how why did all the big direct response players why were they all in the U.S. and nowhere else in the world? And part of the reason was that in the U.S., lists were rented, and in the rest of the world, they weren't. And so anytime you had a player join the market and get a new customer, the whole market grew, not just mm-hmm. that little business. Right. And so all those businesses were growing the market as opposed to, you could say they were all in Europe or everywhere else, they were growing the market too, but they had never got like put together as a market. Right? Still, yeah. Right. And so... Um, and so I think that going and so when when we at, when I when I used to be much more active um, back in 2012 like or 2011 like strategic profits we worked with a bunch of partners and those partners that we worked with were all doing what we were doing getting a certain amount of new blood mm-hmm. through you know organic or paid channels mm-hmm. so that each of us was contributing equally right to, like you know Having as far as like balance yeah so kind of from like an affiliate standpoint you were bringing in new customers but then you were being an affiliate of other products and kind of helping pass along the customers yeah and so a and not like where you're trying to control a market or anything like that but having a few partners who either sell complementary type products um or talk to the same market mm-hmm. um having that is at least like step number one mm-hmm. um i think people have gotten way too away from it uh, right. to a fault and there's really no reason for that um yeah. even if it's part of like a sequence you know the other thing that we used to do at strategic profits was um we would hold people and it and at different times of our life cycle it changed but anywhere from 90 days to 120 days where like when we got a new prospect they didn't see any offers for anybody's stuff mm-hmm. until they've gone through our entire process sure which we had designed to maximize our sales, right? right? So, mm-hmm. um, however, I can tell you that it's much more common than I would have ever thought it was um, as I dove back into Agora, how many uh, co-reg deals oh, are yeah. being done. Yeah. And that might change over time based on legality and stuff, but 
you know, it's interesting because I have a uh, peer that I work, well, um, Katie Vogel is the one of the top marketers at Agora Financial. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, like her, her, her way of doing things is often like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, which was like a culture shock to me. It's like someone brought me a funnel and it's like, this is, uh, this is underperforming like on acquisition on the front end. Like we need, we need to get another $2 per visitor out of this thing for it to work. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll have to study it tonight and stuff like that. And I'll make some recommendations. And, sure. Kate, and Katie was like, uh, I can sell the lead to these three other places, right? <laughs> like, so we'll just get one of them to tag along. We'll share the lead with them. And then uh, we'll be, we'll be ready to go. You're right there. Yeah. Right? And I was like, oh, that, that's a much better solution than mine. Yeah, uh, so, uh, yeah. um, so, you know, Agora does that quite a bit. Like, you know, they, they're, um, they'll go in partners with someone just for the lead and now mm -hmm. they're two are breaking the cost of the lead in half yeah. right so there there are different kinds of strategies but the idea to not be an island mm -hmm. um when you're competing and you really got to almost think about like the big platforms you're competing with them yeah um you know yeah you so want to make like sure creating a network for yourself if you can yeah and it's think never going to be way. as good as you know them as yeah. them i mean you know <laughs> sure. as much as i could say amazon is doing horrible things i still go to amazon first when i want something yeah. and it's Those just people. too convenient and i you know and i can just press a button and i have mm -hmm. it and i'm happy right sure yeah. um but because it's so easy that's probably and this might be a big leap but probably something that i well something i'd love to share with anyone listening is really the is one of the best not that you need to think about this frequently but every once in a while one of the best ways to think about your business is your business is a system to get your customers an outcome, period, right? It's either the best system or it's not. And at the end of the day, you know, it's like, uh, why didn't railroads like take over the car industry, the airline industry and everything else? Because they saw they were part of, uh, you know, they were in the railroad industry. They weren't system. part, yeah. they weren't a system to, d to deliver a solution to a customer, which was just to get to another place, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, and so why did Netflix beat Blockbuster? Because Netflix was a better system than Blockbuster for the consumer to watch a video at home. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so where we have to look as entrepreneurs is looking at our businesses as a system to get an outcome. And how do we make that system less, have less friction, frictionless, right? Uh, for our customers to get that outcome. Right. And you know, sometimes it's not easy to do, um, but in certain industries, it's very easy to do. And, uh, and that's where I think, and that's where platforms end up being able to kind of do things better than we can, sure. right? Um, but thinking about it that way is like a good starting point to kind of understand where you fit in the world of your customers and what responsibility you have if you want to keep that business. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's, it, it almost sounds like you, you better create your own system that you can, you know, and then have partners around there to, you know, similar and have a, have a good benefit for each side. So you can all symbiotic kind of way to lift each other up, but also use the platforms as you can now, because as that quote yeah. said, you know, get in there now right. and almost extract as much as you can into your own system that you can control. Right. And that means downloading whatever data you can get from inside, you know, Facebook's platform, it's advertising platform, because, you know, if you lose the account, you lose access to that You're platform. Done. Yeah. Um, you know, downloading as frequently as you can, whatever lists you can, mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. yeah sure. I remember probably four or five years ago, there was a big push in the internet marketing world to, you know, stop getting affiliates. I remember that like there was, I don't want to name any names, but there were specific like big name marketers at the right. time that were talking about why do you have affiliates? You're giving them 40, 50% of the sale. You can go buy Facebook ads or Google ads and it'll cost you 20% per sale. Right. And now it seems like almost all those same marketers that were saying that um, are sort of kind of reversing. <laughs> and, and yeah. And that's because primarily, at least from my perspective, and I could be wrong on this, but I believe that the primary reason is Facebook mm -hmm. because there were businesses like mine and a lot of like my clients, a lot of people who are at the top of the game today, whose businesses really had a very difficult time advertising on AdWords oh, yeah. mm -hmm. because like there is no keyword match for what it is I offer. Right. Right. So, you know, make money online way too early, mm -hmm. way too believing in BS for me to even spend time on. <laughs> and by the time they're looking for something specific, 
now they're looking for that specific thing. They're not interested in my message at that right. time. They're gone. So yeah. Facebook was a huge game changer. Right. Um, but if you can't rely on Facebook forever, then all of a sudden affiliates become more important because they already have those same people that Facebook can put you in touch with because Facebook is using psychographic and demographic. And that's how those people on those affiliates and joint venture uh, partners lists yeah. are. They're you know a psychographic and a demographic match, at least somewhat, or they wouldn't be in the same niche. And yeah. so you that's know. true. Yeah, so, I mean, that's the, and there's so much data that you can leverage right now. But yeah, and slowly but surely, it seems like those are being stripped away. You know, as they know the control and the power of that data that they want to yeah, we'll see. For themselves. We'll see. I mean, you yeah. know, um, something will happen. Right. Um, cause at the current scenario is not, um, will not last forever. Cause right now these companies are making so much money off of our data and, and they own, they own our data. We don't own it. They mm -hmm. own it and they're profiting from it at the detriment of everyone else. Like it, there's, yeah, there's something inherently wrong there. Something's there. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, lead, and I want to talk about the live stream coming up okay. as well, because I think there's just amazing things and you guys are deep diving on a lot of this stuff, even on what a whole 24 hour yeah, <laughs> clip. So yeah. it's, it's kind of a do. Yeah. You can't, can't cover it all here. Um, what are some other things that we could touch on, uh, before transitioning that way? So I know we, you're big in the AI, right? Um, there's some stuff that the small business owner can use for AI, but a lot of that is still kind yeah. of out of reach. Well, you know, what I would say is, and this does tie into the live stream, mm -hmm. but I can talk about it in a very general way. Um, three fundamental, uh, you know, principles, or you could say like foundational of how to operate going forward. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'd say like the first is to really look at the, I'd say the strategy that you're following and recognize that in today's day and age, strategy is a lot more emergent mm -hmm. than it is. You know, it's not, it's not plan and execute as much as it is to interact with the world and kind of then from what is happening in the world, have that define what your next steps are based on where you want to end up. Okay. Yeah. Right. And where you want to end up, that's where like the idea of see your business as a system that gets a solution for your customers is where you want to end up. Mm -hmm. Like if you stay true to that, then you never really get off track. Sure. So part of strategy is that understanding that it's emergent, it's a lot less plan and execute. It's also part of your strategy then is to align yourself with certain partners, right? Uh, part of that strategy is to recognize the sources that you learn from or get information from or model or follow or mm -hmm. whatever, sure. right? So that like that understanding of the strategy element, like what's your overall strategy to win in an environment that's going to become increasingly hostile mm. um, to small businesses as, you know, these platforms kind of eat more and more of our, you know, more and more of our lunch money. You know, the amount of spending um, online from 2000, I think, in a 13-year period, I think it was like 2004 to 2017, like went up 75 times Gee, from like wow. some number of, you know, double digit billions to trillions. And like right? 80% of that money is probably too. Yeah. The and that's dogs. my point. Like yeah. <laughs> a lot more money is coming online, but is it in your pocket? Is it in my pocket? Mm. Probably not. Right, and right. so that's what I mean by hostile environment. There's a lot, maybe your business has grown. Maybe it's double what it was, but you know, Great. but it's a fraction of the amount of money that's coming in online and being taken by these big platforms. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing would be to really, drill down a little bit more on source because things change so frequently that if you can have a strategy where you do have a few key sources like kind of leading you to what's next, um, I think that's really important. One of those sources for sure should be about what big tech is doing online, right? Mm -hmm. So that you're not taken totally off guard at least the next keep time, up with the trends yeah, and just what keep they're up, like, doing. You know, yeah. And that's not, I'm not saying spend a lot of time on it, but if you, I would venture to guess that most entrepreneurs haven't spent any time, <laughs> right, right? right? Like too busy yeah, in their, their own thing, thing right? right? Yeah. So there's that. And also, you know, understanding that even though there's a tremendous amount of, of proclaimed expertise out there, there are true experts out there where you can uh, shortcut tremendously. Um, you know, the learning curve to get mm -hmm. any kind of outcome. And then I'd say last would be speed that, you know, the understanding that, yeah, today's the easiest day to grow your business. 
tomorrow is going to be a little bit harder. The next day is going to be a little bit harder. And that every platform in their infancy generally welcomes uh, small business and direct response marketers with open arms. Mm -hmm. And we get mm -hmm. to like um, do whatever we want in the beginning and make lots of money doing it. Um, speed is important in regards to quickly executing, letting the execution guide your understanding so action creates clarity yep right mm -hmm. um which then feeds an emergent strategy sure um, it all develops yeah from there. It, it's 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 you know it's they support each other but speed in every area but more and more now um in execution is probably vital in two questions i want to go back to your second point really quick right. uh and don't want to belabor this too much but what are a handful of sources of uh resources or where do you look for trends that people can stay on top of huh. um well i i think i uh, like i have a feedly uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah rss yeah. feeder um yep. i have a feedly tab that has like every futurist right so okay, that i yeah. can go look at like what's top of mind for them uh that's one place that I consistently look. I'm trying to think of where do I go. Peter to... Diamandis puts out a good weekly newsletter with his. Yes, I'm on his. Hands. I'm on yeah. his thing. He he's projecting out further. Yeah, than, yeah, he's way out there. You know, it's <laughs> like I want, I want to know what I need to do tomorrow, right? right? And and uh, to make tomorrow the like, the most profitable day that I can make it. Mm. Sure. You know, it, looking backwards, and so. Yeah, for that you have to kind of look at what the futurists are saying. Look at what um, I just I have I just I guess I go through a ton of stuff. You do, um, I know we do. <laughs> and <laughs> you cover the way that you do that. And so. yeah, and it's not only the covering of stuff though. It's 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 um, it's it's covering a lot of stuff, and then being able to see the connections in them. Mm. And that's where, like you know, the last time we spoke, I was mentioning this guy. Uh, Tiago Fort, mm -hmm. uh, because I went through a course of his called Build Your Second Brain, which was mm -hmm. all about that, about storing information in a way to provoke serendipitous experiences uh, with the same information so that you can draw more connections. Um, so I would say that, yeah, going vast until you find a few people that really resonate mm -hmm. more than others who you seem to doing be. your homework yeah. yeah and so there are a few that i've found but i'll keep like the individual sources uh quiet primarily just because i don't want to send them lots of business <laughs> sure um, <laughs> it, like if i was friendly with you them, don't I have would to say name them it's i okay. would say it but uh <laughs> a couple of them i'm not friendly with um but uh so it just it wouldn't it would bother me to send them traffic <laughs> um fine. but uh but it really is uh yeah who are the students you know who, like who are the ones who are the people, that, and this might also just be a default, so if it is, like, I would just say I might be biased here. Who are the people, I just read this great uh, article this morning, and it was really funny because it was the same point I've made a bunch of times, but made in a totally different way. I was so not even expecting that the article was about that. Sure. The article was about, like, what the best content producers whose content has gone most viral, what mental map, um, mental model are they using? Mm hmm I was like, oh, that should be interesting. Um, the mental model that he talked about in the article, and it was a good article, um, was winner take all. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I've often had a similar message, which is like, make time for greatness. In other words, like, better everything that, every piece of content that's ever made a difference in my life, like as far as that I created and made a difference, was something that I spent a bunch of time on. It wasn't, you know, I didn't like bang something out in an hour mm -hmm. and be done with it, right? Right. Um, and that most people, that's what they do. It's like a blog post a day, but it's a shitty blog post right. each day, it's or it's a moderate one, or but it's not great. They don't allow time for greatness. Yeah. And that's what this guy was saying, like the, who wrote this article. Like He spends over $1,000 on research on every article he writes. He spends at least a minimum of 50 hours like mm -hmm. working, because he's wow. trying to make every article he writes be the best article in that field on that topic, right? And mm -hmm. he's gotten a tremendous amount of viral stuff. So... That's something I've taught people, um, but it's the same of what I like to consume, mm. yeah. right? Like, yeah. so, like, you know, a famous one is wait, but why? Mm -hmm. if you, you know, yeah, right? Like, yeah. people who spend a lot of time thinking so that they've kind of spent some of the time that you're going to need to think, right? And then it kind of clearly states how that looks. Yeah. Like yeah. I mean, there are great synthesizers out mm -hmm. there, and those are the people that um, are 
some of the sources and then people who have developed models, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like, so people who have figured out a way to get an outcome or, you know, do something that no one else had figured out. Those are the people. Yeah. Mm. That's good. Cool. Um, and, and the other thing, yeah, I was just going to mention, you know, uh, your third point was all about platforms guarding more and more. That's why like we're doing a lot of stuff on Reddit, for instance, right. like Reddit ads, super cheap, but mm-hmm. it can be very effective and targeted Twitter ads as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Quora, you know, so there's other platforms yeah. out there that are probably easier to leverage. And it's uh, about then keeping that bond with whoever is a listener yeah. or getting their, you know, their, their physical mailing address, like oh, yeah. becoming yeah. much more present in their lives so that if you were to lose a platform, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, now let's talk about that live stream. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> uh, give us the scoop. I know you're bringing all your buddies over there. We're actually going to be there as well, which is really cool. Stoked on that. Yeah. Um, give us the, the high level and then you know, we can well, talk this a little is, bit. Yeah, so in order for me to help Agora the way I wanted to, uh, at the end of the day, I'm a strategist and I'm a generalist. Like you wouldn't want me managing your Facebook ad campaign <laughs> or really managing anything <laughs> singular because um, it's not my sweet spot. And so in order to help Agora the maximum I can, I broke out the Rolodex and thought of like, who are the people that I most respect, whether I know them or not, Mm -hmm. it didn't really matter. Who are the people I most respect in the industry who have either like developed different tactics that everyone kind of takes for granted now, Mm -hmm. or, uh, people that are on the cutting edge of today or, um, who I would go to if, I had like a hundred dollars left in my pocket and I needed something to work. Like who would I go to? And, you know, created a list of about 40 to 50 people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, where I don't think I haven't invited all 40 or 50 of those people Mm -hmm. yet, but I'm slowly doing that. I think I'm about 30, um, inviting them to a live stream that we're going to do out of Delray beach, Florida, out of Mark Ford's cigar bar. He's also known as Michael Masterson. Mm Um, and, we are going to be broadcasting for 24 hours straight, uh, strategies, tactics, um, and different ways of operating online that will win in 2020 based on what's happening with the platforms. Right. So these are the people that I think are the best in every different area of online marketing and giving you, we're giving the people that are on the live stream, their best advice on what they need to do in 2020 based on what's happening with the platforms, what's happening just elsewhere economically and what they see in their particular area of expertise, what should people focus on? And so, yes, we're going to broadcast for 24 hours to start at 7 p.m. on February, 7 p.m. Eastern on February 19th. I've done this before. Uh, The last (laughs) one I did was a lot more boring uh, because it was just (laughs) me sitting at a desk answering questions for 24 hours, 26 hours. Jesus. (laughs) Um, And we beat John McCain that day. It was October, 2008. So it was during the election. Yeah. Um, And, but uh, yeah, that was just me at a desk answering questions for 26 hours straight. So it was a little boring this time. um, We've got a lot of uh, wonderful people flying in. Yeah. Yeah, You know, so everyone from, uh, Ryan Dice to Roland Frazier to Russell Brunson to Todd Brown to Neil Patel mm-hmm. to um, James Von Ellswick and uh, about 25 other people right now I'm drawing a blank on. Mm-hmm. Um, but basically, uh, anyone who has created something that you probably take for granted as a marketer or an entrepreneur today um, is probably going to be in the room. That's cool. Yeah. cool. There's yeah, the, so many different perspectives. The URL for it is csib2020.com. And then when you get there, it's going to ask for like a code or a password kind of thing to be able to get access. And you're going to use the code hustle to get in. I mean, you should just check out the page anyway, because it just looks freaking cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been seeing a, an opt in page like that or a registration. Page, and it's just that enough. You should go there to study that. Yeah. And it's actually pretty cool because that, that's just a way to kind of keep it private. Mm-hmm. Um, but then behind that, um, if people opt in, mm-hmm. right, like what they're going to get are three presentations that I did uh, for Agora in France at, uh, Bill Bonner's castle. So, mm. uh, this was in France this past summer, uh, teaching all the publishers, all the international publishers of all the different Agora divisions. Uh, I did a two day workshop. These are the first three presentations from the workshop. So the first one is like 13 sneaky ways to increase conversion rates without changing a word of copy. The next one is 11 ways to increase uh, card value without changing the product cost or something. And then the third one is 
stealth, uh, VSLs and webinars and other methods of stealth selling. And so those three presentations that I gave to just the publishers, like that's what people get for free when they register for the live stream. Right nice. on, man. So yep. that's, yeah. Uh, C, uh, let's just say one more time, CSIB2020.com and you put the code word hustle right there when you get there. Now, are there any like topics or people or, you know, what are you most excited to, to hear about from this live stream? Is there any specific topics mm -hmm. that you're really sort of pumped to, to go down the rabbit hole? Um, I'm not sure. You know, I, I, I think I'm excited to hear what everyone has to share. And I'm excited about how that kind of comes together mm -hmm. after the fact. Yeah. So, you know, in general, it's, I think there are going to be a lot of really great ideas and a lot of really great stuff being shared mm -hmm. but i think what will be really interesting for me is what are what are the patterns of that in other words you know are, yeah. are a lot of people is there a common thing that most people are recommending is there because uh, that's how i tend to think right you well, know this I'm is a perfect environment for, patterns. for that yeah. yeah and so i'm interested in that uh but i'm but then this kind of environment also kind of sets up something that's really great for the viewers mm. And that is, is that it ends up being a little bit of an ego play and everyone wants to deliver something of higher value than everyone else. One yeah. of right? <laughs> and so the, the people at home watching are the beneficiaries yeah. of this competition that is going on in this <laughs> cigar bar that we're live streaming out of, of who can deliver the best stuff that will make the biggest difference in the most amount of people's lives in 2020. So... This is going to be crazy. It'll be fun. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Are you going to be up for the whole 24 hours? I will be up for the whole 24 hours. I could probably go 48 hours when we're talking about marketing yeah. and business growth. Well, that's true. So easy. are you, are you like MC in it? Is that kind of your role or? I'm definitely on camera most of the time. I don't know if we're going to have an MC or not. I'm generally not the most entertaining individual. <laughs> so um, I'm sure that there would be some reservation of me being the MC, <laughs> um, but maybe an MC sidekick or something like gotcha. that. Very cool. Should we, uh, I don't know if we're allowed to mention your future podcast or if that's... Sure. Be, I don't see why not. You want to talk a little bit about that or quickly mention it? You could You could probably talk more intelligently <laughs> about it than I could at this moment. What's the name of the podcast? <laughs> oh, I know that. <laughs> I know that. No, oh, I know what that. Is it? What is it? Um, <laughs> well, this is the one we're playing with because I own the domains and everything and it kind of is a pun on words. Uh, Secrets of being rich. That's it. Oh, yeah. Nice. So play totally. in your name. Yeah. yeah. Secrets of being rich. I mean, I think it's going to be... Yeah, so we're we're helping you on that right. and I think it's going to be awesome because that is you and mm. bringing in... I'm sure you're going to have some solo episodes, but you also sure. have, uh, you know, your friends, like the folks coming on the live stream. It's just going to be deep dives, like kind of like the live stream itself. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm personally stoked on listening to it, but even better, you know, working closely on that and to make that thing. Cause I think, I think you're going to do a great job, even though, uh, I don't think you've had a podcast before. No, but, I haven't. But, so it'll be a new venture, but I, you, you, just talking with you, I know you, you're going to you know, just have all these different concepts that a lot of people are going to light up yeah. about. No, I love the way your brain works. I'm looking forward to sort of hearing how it works with other people constantly. So For sure. Yeah, it will be fun. For yeah. sure. Secret to be enriched. So that's coming out soon, probably after the launch or something yeah, like that. Yeah, sometime after the launch. Got it. Yeah. All right. Very so, cool. When I come out, from like my little cubby hole for, after I've hidden <laughs> for like two weeks after the live stream. I don't blame but, you. <laughs> yeah. When I look right. like an outcast from uh, what was the what was the um, where you had the volley Wilson? You had the volleyball oh, Wilson. Uh, was it outcast? I think so. I, uh, uh, Shipwrecked or uh, <laughs> don't anyone? whatever. Don't know the name of that movie. <laughs> Tom no Hanks movie Shipwrecked. <laughs> where Castaway? Yeah, 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 yeah. Castaway. Like cast yeah, right. We're gonna yeah. cast it somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Um, all right. So uh, we'll, we'll say it. CSIB2020.com. Use Hustle. It's in the show notes. So anyone driving or whatever, just go to the show notes. Evergreenprofits.com. Um, we always ask about your favorite book. Okay. I know you read like 20 a week. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> you have a whole speed reading right. process. Uh, what's the first maybe two or three that just have impacted you that come to mind right now? Um, okay. Um, one would be, I saw this person reading this book on the train from Baltimore and uh, it was said uh, 3 million copies sold, uh, bestseller in Japan, and it was uh, The Courage to Be Disliked. Okay. And I love that book. It's based on um, the psychology of Alfred Adler. And for those who don't know, and I knew Alfred Adler only because of the transformational stuff I had gone through. Sure. Um, but Alfred Adler was a peer of... Um, of uh, 
of Freud and Jung, mm -hmm. um, and has some very different thoughts of um, what causes us to do what we do. And uh, the book itself was great. It's told in a parable, you know, so it's kind of uh, repetitive at times. But, um, but the information was really good, and okay. I think and it aligns very well with uh, the way I like to think about things. So I think there's also that part of it. Um, I just read Attention Merchants, which I really liked. I found that fascinating. Um, that goes like, th because that covers where we are today as far as Facebook, Google, you know, Amazon really being in charge of our attention, kind of dominating it all the way back in time to John Caples mm -hmm. and the people like who wrote the classics of direct response. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's actually pretty good. He wrote another book, the guy that wrote that, and I'm forgetting the name of the book off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll find it. Yeah. up. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, then, um, and then the last book, uh, I read pretty quickly and I'm actually taking notes on now. Uh, but Jay Abraham called me and he was like, they wrote a book about us. You got to read it. So um, <laughs> that book is called Driven. Okay. And nice. it's got a red cover. I don't remember because there's a bunch of books. I've yeah. read like three books named Driven, but uh, this one was <laughs> this one was, yeah. was all about ADD, the ADD brain. It's it, like the subhead is what top CEOs, Navy SEALs and blah, blah, blah have in common. And maybe you do too. And uh, yeah, it was very interesting. It actually... Taught me stuff about my own brain that I didn't even know, uh, <laughs> and uh, and that yeah, if if you have ADD at all, it's a fascinating read. Awesome, I'll pick it up all three. <laughs> well, yeah, of course, no brainer, and they'll be linked up in the show notes too. Rich, it's been awesome, man. Oh, well, thank you very for much. Having me. Yeah, appreciate you, dude.